Hello. Hi again. We're just um, waiting for the panellists to have their video and unmuted. Um, so hi everyone again. We're going to finish the day with um, a 30 minute session which brings back all the speakers who've been able to stay on with us. I think we may have lost Libby who got up at three, three o'clock their time to, uh, to share, so we'll forgive her that. Um, to discuss some of the key strands and questions which have come through the talks today um, so that we can get the kind of speakers to have a discussion together and um, get their input. So if you do have anything, any kind of burning questions that are lingering or things you would like to ask all the speakers together, please do add these to the, the session Q&A channel. We'd love to ask them. I think I'm just waiting for the other speakers. Hi, Giles. Hi. Hi, James. So I think this might be all of us. Unfortunately, Tava wasn't able to join because her Wi-Fi in Brazzaville went right down. Um, thank you so much for staying on to the end of the day. I know it's a long day, especially on Zoom. Um, really appreciate your time in, in discussing some of these things. So we have our attendees, I think, are still thinking about some questions. So the NATSCA committee have prepared some initial ones. And firstly, we wanted wondered if we could sort of return <coughs> that we started with, which is in talking about the Anthropocene. And we were interested in your thoughts on the relative value of Anthropocene as either a sort of theoretical notion to discuss environmental breakdown or a solid geological marker. Um, and because that really affects potentially how museums choose to engage audiences with it. So sort of any thoughts of those different ways of framing the Anthropocene, particularly with reference to museums? To me. Well, I'm not <laughs> an expert on this by any means, but uh, just it's, it's an interesting one because we were actually about to have an exhibition called Anthropocene. Uh, we changed the name of it. It's now called Our Broken Planet. Mm -hmm. But it's all about that very thing. And so we've got a, it's sort of opening up in stages and the first stage has just opened and it's just looking at various different ways that uh, human beings have affected the planet and using specimens to sort of tell that story. So for example, one of the things I've added to that is the, it's a skeleton of a huge black marlin. It's about three meters long. And that's just to make the point that uh, what we've done to the ocean, the way we changed the whole sort of food web there, all the sort of the large predatory things have been, uh, the, the figure that I was told was, I don't know if this is, this is true, but it, apparently something like 90% of the large predatory animals in the ocean have been removed in the last sort of 50, 60 years. Mm. Um, and the one that, that I do know a bit more about, which is really depressing, is what's happening to coral reefs. And that, that's such a big feature in, that, um, in so many sort of tropical oceans. But uh, the, the yeah. current thought is that coral will be gone completely in the next 60 years. And that's all because of us. And that's a major sort of effect on the environment. So you're really thinking about it in a kind of broader terminology then? Because often I think as um, when we're doing, thinking about paleontological timeframes, we might be thinking about fossils and markers and particular dates. And it was really interesting listening to Simon's talk um, around firstly, how do you determine that? But that this, there seem like two different things going on here for us being so, it's so immediate to us right now. Simon, I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about um, like coral reefs because one of one of the uh, one of the things about using a coral reef for this uh, as a geological archive is <laughs> most geologists. Well, I say most geologists might consider a coral archive a geological archive because it's actually from a living thing. But but actually, once once the surface has um, you know, it's stopped living. The skeleton is actually a, a fossil, you know, once it's finished growing. So there's this sort of, it's a living fossil because it's attached to an, an organism, but it's fossilized in its own, its own record. And it's interesting. So, so we have this, so, so if we use a, for, a, a piece of coral, for example, as a, as the marker for the Anthropocene, and then like, you know, in 60 years time, maybe, maybe a bit more, but you know, potentially there might not be coral, living coral. So, so we have we have this sort of, we have this uh, material to explore that is a fossil by its own making, but potentially could be a fossil in in a century because you won't have living stuff 
being formed. You also have deep corals and things. But yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of to and and fro in between time scales, and I think that's what's interesting about the Anthropocene is how to how to explore these incredibly long time scales, like the last hundred thousand years, which is nothing geologically but a massive amount of time for the human story and how to then relate that to something like microplastics in a, in a fish stomach which could be from last week but is now you know in, a, in an archive so it's how to sort of like explore these very big time scales um, which I think is quite a challenge. And there will be some sort of interesting markers in the sort of sedimentary record I mean there will be if I understand it correctly, there would be a sort of a layer of radioactive material between 1945 and sort of when all the, the tests and things were going on and Chernobyl and things like that. That will all leave a little sort of trace in the in the rock, I think. It's yeah, so, it's, so for Simon so, was looking at, I'm not sure if you're able to join James, but Simon's talk was um Simon's investigating this actively at the moment. Oh right, okay. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, no, so no, so for something so for something like um radionuclides, it's uh, we go back to that thing that um uh, the micro paleo, you know, how do you explore something? It's hard enough exploring something which is microscopic, but how do you start communicating isotopes and radionuclides and electrons? And you know, so this is so this is a long way, you know, moving away perhaps from natural history, but into the more sort of physical science realm. But it's all part of the natural history of planet Earth. It's, it's we we have now become a, a, an agent of natural history and it's how to sort of incorporate that into a perhaps more traditional natural history ideas. Interesting. Um, so put drawing on that, um, someone has asked to Simon, you've obviously looked at lots of fresh samples from around the world. Have you analysed any museum material? I guess they could mean biological or geological material like cause. Um, no, so so most of the material we've collected is I was you know so it's it's been freshly collected, but it extends down to about you know sometimes two to three hundred years, sort of seventeenth century sort of thing. So it's fresh geological material, but it still has a has a temporal element going back in time. But no, there's there's nothing. We're not studying like a a museum collection like we were talking about earlier about using perhaps some sort of archive collection of of wombat skins or something, you know, something that's being collected regularly or, or bird skins or something like that. I don't see, I don't see, there's no reason why not to, I can't, you know, cause like stratigraphy is always associated with rocks, but it's, it's really the study of materials over time. And so you can have, if you can have a stratigraphy of bird skins, it's just, it's just not a traditional format of geological investigation. I don't see why, why it matters. I think I think the thing is with with our work right now we we are f coming from a geological point of view, and so if you start analysing archives of um, toothfish, you know it it just is is maybe too far away from geology to make it a geological question. So a lot of museum curators are going to have to reorganise our stores and check we've got good enough dates on our. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting though. And um it's really interesting to think that actually these questions are very live. They're you know within someone who's working for this for this day to day, it's still very much there. Mm. And so someone has also asked, given that you have all conducted research looking at in various ways at the changing impacts of humans on the environment, what do you hope your research will prompt in the individuals who see or read it or think to, to think <coughs> So do you have like a best case outcome on that level? Well, Obviously, yeah. acknowledging that the responsibility they say for systemic change lies with government. Yeah. So, 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 in one sense, it's answering a, it's answering a question that was sort of created by sort of a geological question. So, you hope to answer that is, you know, can we identify human activity stratigraphically? So, we can, you know, we can do that in archaeology, but you know, it's to be creating this marker that then can be applied globally. But then there's also this. If, you, if we do say now that the Holocene has finished and we've just spent 70 years living in a new epoch, and so geologically we are now a transforming part of planet Earth, then will that have a, 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 you know, an effect psychologically with, with humans on the planet to, to make us realise perhaps we are not living in the Holocene and we have this planet Earth which is resilient to change, but we actually are capable of 
transforming it on a global scale. I mean, so you imagine that everyone will, well, you know, like you would hope that it would change people's perceptions about what effect humans really have as on mass, not, you know, like, you know, as a, as an entity, as an organism, we, we clearly have a geological force. Um, so it's, it's how it gets communicated, how it gets translated, that sort of urgency. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about human environmental change since centuries ago. You know, the effect of humans on planet Earth is a long running thing. So it's been known for a long time, but it's, 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 for, it's for magnitude and the scale since mid 20th century, which, which is, um, I think people need to appreciate more just how dramatic that change has been in a, in, in, in a, in a human lifetime. So do you worry about that for your kind of interacting with this material through your research? Do you think the magnitude isn't well understood or do you think people are grasping it? Um, yeah, I mean, you do. I mean, I mean, I've worked in, I've worked mainly in lakes um, and, you, and, and in the UK and you see, you know, if you pull up lake sediment from the 1920s, it is often dramatically different. So you sort of physically can see that the lake has changed dramatically as a result of nutrient inputs or sediment in wash and things like that. So you can, there is this physical evidence that we can see in a lot of, in recent geology, but the planet and the landscapes have changed. Um, it's just interesting now that we have these sort of markers, which are microscopic radionuclide markers, which, so you don't, you do, what you don't see in every core from around the world is you suddenly don't see a dramatic change. You, you will see it geochemically, but you don't, you, you know, it's not like the rocks go from brown to red or, you know, and so we have that sort of information to communicate, but it's, it's still quite a subtle effect, but it's measurable. How about for you, James? So that question was, you know, given your research, is there anything you think about in terms of having impact on what people do, do about it or think about it? Well, I think one thing that we can see a lot um, and we can show with specimens as well is the way that the environment changes over time due to what we've done to it. I mean, there's obvious examples like things like building dams. So one of the, the fish that we were going to have in the, um, I think we still will in one of the later stages of our Broken Planet exhibition is the Chinese paddlefish, which is a very bizarre looking thing. It's a bit like a sort of sturgeon and it has a big paddle like snout. And those used to be, uh, you used to find them in the river Yangtze. And I think the last one was seen in 2003 and they've not been found since. Um, and part of the reason they've, they've gone is because there's a huge dam that's been built across their, their, their migration route. Um, but there's also things like um, introductions as well. So for example, in one of the Great Lakes in Africa, Lake Victoria, um, this very large predatory fish called the Nile perch was introduced into there as a food fish. And that is uh, just um, eaten loads and loads of the, the fish that were there already. So there are lots of groups of smaller fish that are um, mainly cichlids that have gone extinct because this, this fish has just eaten them all. So there are things like that. And then we can then, that's when our collection comes into play because we can say, look, we have things that were collected in that lake before this fish was introduced. And this is a little tiny snapshot of what it used to be like. Um, and yeah, we have um, specimens of the Chinese paddlefish as well. People quite often ask us what we have that is now extinct, and that, that would be an example. Wow. So we've got a question here, um, and I was thinking about this as well. So the, the, the talks today have had a real scientific focus, and we've mainly heard from big national organisations or kind of international collaborations. Um, have you got any ideas about how smaller collections can contribute to research in the climate crisis and biodiversity? biodiversity crisis? I think if nothing else, um, any collection at all is a great way to um, get people talking, to interest people, to engage people, to bring people in and sort of start a conversation about something. And that's the great thing about collection. You can get it to tell all different kinds of stories. So if nothing else, you can use it to sort of interest people in the natural world. And once people are interested in the natural world, then they, they, you want to start thinking about how to conserve it. So it's the sort of first step down that road, if nothing else. Mm. And have you seen any, have you, do you have any kind of ideas or examples of collaborations that have drawn in smaller collections, which often have just as valuable material, but perhaps less resource, they're maybe less well known about, if that makes sense. Not that I can think of. So I guess in the UK, um, you know, that's keen to to 
uh, advocate for collections across the UK and our data shows there's around 150 million specimens held in museums across the UK. It's a huge resource. Um, the UK must, has one of the best collections of natural science and you know, one of the richest, oldest and from around the world collections. And it's that question, isn't it, at a time of crisis, we can see how valuable these collections are. Like how can we mobilize their potential without huge amounts of money and time? But um, yeah, it's not an easy one to answer. Yeah, well, um, just just slightly relevant to that. We we've um, there's a new UNESCO um, and property and related UNESCO program um, run through the IGBP, which is the International Geo Geobiosphere Program. Anyway, but what what they what there's this idea of like developing sort of grassroots anthropocene research because especially in the global south, you don't have this sort of big institutional sort of research bodies who sort of like are interested in you know going prophecy you know it's very very skewed towards western europe and and america um so and china you know the big industrial places so so one of the things we're quite keen on developing is is how like local museums you know sort of be sort of in, where, where information is about natural history and potentially sort of environmental change you know is being well, and also experts as well. I mean, like, you know, say about the small collections around the UK, if you want to talk to someone about snails, then it's probably your, lo your local museum with, a, with, a, with an expert there, or they'll know something, or they'll know someone or someone else. So, so we're trying to develop this sort of UNESCO project where you have these sort of grassroots upwards. So it's not just teaching in schools and creating sort of educational products that can be shared. It's also sort of contacting these sort of smaller institutions. So that's mainly focused in, in, in um, you know, say the global south, but there's no reason why it can't, those sort of models can't be applied to places like the UK. So it's just maybe, it's just maybe a question of reframing some of those collections, yeah. you know, about, about comparing, you know, like, like, like you said about the big marlin, about, you know, how big fish used to be in the 1930s compared to now, you know, or, or the size of things. You know, that's, there's quite a lot of information that you have in these sort of, you know, like the Norwich example, there's some amazing stuff there. I bet if you did some comparative anatomy of some of the species that, from that Norwich collection from the 1920s, you'd see quite interesting differences between what you have from a taxidermy collection to what you would find nowadays. I think that'd be a really interesting avenue for research. Um, That's really interesting. And I think the idea of grassroots is really, we tend to think of these big international structures, infrastructures, and they're actually quite difficult to support um, even quite large collections to engage with because they require a lot of resource mm. um, in terms of time and equipment and that kind of thing. Sorry, I think Giles is having trouble talking to us. No, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Oh, you, you sorted <laughs> it. Oh, well done. I, I, Sorry, I, I, Alex. That's all right. Yeah, that's really interesting. I just think that kind of any grassroots models are really interesting for us to have a look at. And um, those questions of representation have come through quite a bit today as well. That thing about um, you know, this narrative of humans and, and actually the, the kind of history is very different across the world. And if we don't have the representation, particularly from the global south, that story is, is skewed, isn't it? Isn't it? And it's, um, yeah, sort of yes, that but, but, I'll, I'll send a link around to this, this, um, this UNESCO initiative, because it's just that sort of that thinking that, you know, it's that underrepresentation. So we, we talk about the Anthropocene as a global thing, but it's very much not everyone gets it or not you know because in you know what we consider environmental change is very different to what other people consider environmental change or, or what are the priorities of, of the changing planet are very different in parts of the world um so we need to sort of somehow sort of pick up that granularity and sort of grassroots differences between nations and in various places but you know like i think i think museum collections it's been really interesting today thinking about natural history collections because they are really incredible resource and very like a spaces for engagement as well and scattered yeah. you know, we know about the uk mostly <clears throat> scattered all across yeah. the uk as well interesting and i guess we had um, some final strands around storytelling so we talked about ways to engage people with them um, or like from from visitors to kind of funders and managers with the value the potential value of these collections um we've had a question around do we think that more institutions need communication and psychology specialisms um is it that like advertisers are able to sell us trainers really well but we can't 
that the science messages are not coming out as well or something like that? Like, do we need different approaches to our communication about this, I suppose? Or have you seen a good examples? Well, David Attenborough is a fantastic example of science communication. Just going back to what you said before about how to get the message across. I mean, that um, I can't remember if it was the Blue Planet or it was the end of one of his big TV shows and he made a, a plea about plastic and then everything started to change overnight. Everything, supermarkets started charging for bags and it immediately had a huge effect. So if you can do it well, I think people are receptive and you can, you can get that message across. How about you, Simon? Have you seen anything in your work globally about um, I think, I think um, well, it's all about communicate. I mean, like, you know, we, as scientists, we all do, we all say we do very good communication, but, it, you know, so much science and information doesn't get translated to effective things that, you know, to get things done. So I think we all need to improve how that, that happens. And it's not all about papers, um, you know, and also, and also museums, you know, like, because, you know, you need, it's how to, it's how to get this information out from museums as well, because it's good that you can go to a museum and see it, but you also need to think about how, how that information leaves the museum um, in a sort of coherent way as well. So I think we could probably take a lot of lessons from how to sell trainers and, and sort of apply it to natural history. But not ruin the world. Yeah. Charles, I'm sorry, but you've had technical issues, but, um, I know you worked on the, the Challenger project and that was, I think your uh, research focused at the Natural History Museum, but that project, like you highlighted the website and there was really a fantastic kind of collaborative effort to kind of try and map at least Challenger material across the UK. I wondered if you had any thoughts about how we can all collaborate to try and release the potential from the kind of wider, including smaller collections. Yeah, and very much so. I mean, so my apologies, I had to drop out for a bit. Um, Right. A colleague of mine is, is leaving for good and I had to go and take him down to, to give his keys back. <laughs> uh, um, no, very much so. I touched on it in my talk. I don't think we always get it completely right, um, but digitization can help. I mean, clearly, sometimes there are issues with you need funds to digitize things, but how we how we put our digital information out there can help. I mean, We've heard some examples today, uh, but one example certainly from geology is um, geocase. Um, it's, it, it was an old European um, portal for geological collections, uh, but as part of DISCO, which we've heard about today, um, we're beginning to open that up again and, and create these portals. And really there's no reason, uh, you know, even if you've got a data set of 100 specimens, if you can get those 100 records onto portals like that, uh, that can help to create that sort of general um, networking environment where you can raise the profile of collections like that. Um, and also, I mean, I guess a shout out for Natsker and, and for, for GCG and, and for groups like the subject specialist networks. I mean, they've been great for Challenger. Um, that's been mentioned several times today. And other things like Blaschka, for example, you know, it's, it's raised the profile of those types of collections across across um, certainly the country, but also across Europe as well. So um, there are ways that we, we can all get involved in that. But um, I mean, even coming from a large institution, I do share the, the worry that sometimes it does take a lot of money and resource to make these collections, um, to put those collections out there. And I was kind of trying to say that a bit in my talk today. I mean, we're lucky that we got internal funds to hire a postdoc. Who did a lot of that work but we couldn't have done that internally as part of our everyday work uh, and, and likewise we had to 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 make contacts with universities um, to get that un get the studentship that marina did uh, to study the ocean sediments um, and i guess that's that's what we're trying to do as well to try and make those connections and try and try and find those people who might be able to make the best of those of those collections Brilliant, thank you so much. We're nearly at four o'clock, so I wondered if any of you had um, any final thoughts or questions you wanted to touch base on. No pressure, we don't. Oh, fantastic. And actually, I mean, the stories that you've shared are, I think, helpful to all of us as well. You know, if we're trying to explain a theoretical value, it can be hard, but if you have some real concrete case studies to draw on, 
it's really helpful way of, of showing and helping people engage with um, the scientific value of these collections in the context of environmental crisis because it's really happening. Mm. And if we can find more sort of grassroots led ways of reaching and collaborating with underrepresented organisations um, in perhaps new ways, that sounds really exciting as well. So we're at the end of the conference day one, and I'd like to say a huge big thank you to our speakers um, for preparing your talks, for joining us today, for your time and expertise and thinking about our questions. Really, really appreciate it. Also, thank you to our ten attendees. We've had up to 130 attendees throughout the day, which is great. Um, for all your comments in the chat, your questions as well, all your support in the AGM, it's really appreciated. And although we are virtual, I feel like we've had quite a community feel as well. It's not quite the same as gathering around for coffee, but it's been, um, it's had that really nice community feel. So thank you so much for your input. So tomorrow we're starting at 10 o'clock. Hope you can join us. If you can't, um, Glenn and Justine, our technical experts, are working really hard to get the recorded content online as soon as possible. It takes a bit of time because we need to check these auto-generated subtitles, which you might have noticed are a bit dodgy. And, um, and that kind of thing. But we will get the content online so that it has a really good legacy. And we found that with the previous conference we did, it has really good access afterwards. And we'll be letting everyone know as well. So I think that's it for now. Thank you again. And I hope to see you tomorrow, if not then soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks.